بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد Today, inshallah, uh, is our next uh, lecture on the feminine journey series. And this week or this month's lecture, as has been advertised and can be seen by a title slide, is on motherhood in Islam. And it's a topic, of course, greatly needed to speak about from an Islamic perspective, but also requires a lot of attention, classes, and also promotion uh, to show both Muslims and non-Muslims how the beautiful religion of Islam honors mothers, encourages women to take on the high status of motherhood, and also understanding the sacrifices and rewards that come with this kind of um, station. And in today's uh, lecture, we're just going to cover as much as we can the time that's allotted. Obviously, this is a big topic, uh, so much so that there have been master's dissertations written on it and many other books written on the topic. So inshallah ta'ala, we we will try to do today, just do an overview of some of the most important themes and topics related to motherhood. And a lot of the topics connected to it, like parenting and things like that, we've covered before. Right. So, inshallah ta'ala, we try to keep it more focused to motherhood itself. Uh, the table of contents which we hope to cover, inshallah ta'ala, introduction. And then the virtue of motherhood in Islam. Motherhood is natural. Right? We're going to address the idea of the maternal instinct. Does it exist or not? Talk about the qualities of successful motherhood. The rights and responsibilities of motherhood. And finally, examples from the pious predecessors and the people before us. Uh, of great mothers, right? Because obviously we're looking for uh, tangible, applicable, practical examples, not just theory. So inshallah ta'ala, Allah gives us permission to be able to do that uh, without taking more time because we'll leave some time at the end for questions and answers as well. To begin, the definition of of mother, right? When we say a mother, um, and by extension, the concept of motherhood, al-umumah, it's something that requires a definition, as because we'll see there's more than one type of mother. But the ulama, when they mention the linguistic meaning of um, mother, is the origin of something, asl of something, and it's, and it's imad, and it's pillar or it's umud, it's, 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 it's like it's number one uh, foundation, right? So the, the imad or the asl of something. For example, um al qura, right? The city. Called Mecca, referred to as Umm al-Qura, the mother of all, of all um, cities or, or villages. So here we have in Surah 43, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He talks about in Surah Zukhruf that the Quran wa innahu fi Umm al-Kitabi. Now, verily, this is Quran is in the mother of the books. يعني لوح المحفوظ Umm al-Kitab, and we know the Fatiha is also right. It's considered the opening book or Umm al-Quran, and like this. So the um, when you hear this word, it just means origin. Kitab al-um, Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah. And then we go now from that linguistic meaning to the technical one. Uh, that Mufassir al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah, writes in his tafsir. Uh, the word mother is a comprehensive word for every female that has a birth relationship. This includes the physical mother, her mother, and her mother. And so the mom, your actual mother who gave birth to you, then her mom, the grandma, and then the one above. Going upwards. So as we know, right, that in Islam, the lineages, they go upwards when it comes to ascending and downwards when it comes to descending. And then he says the mother of the father. So your, your father is mother and his and, and his grandmother and it going upwards. So essentially, he defined technically mother as the one who has a birth relationship to you. Either birthed you, I give birth to you. That's the primary mother. Umm al-Haqiqi, right? The real mother. And then from there, so Umm al is the real mother. And then goes from there, those who are extended. So the mother of the mother, still a mother, right? So grandma can be considered one. And going upwards, etc. And then going to the paternal side. So as we'll see later, that the definition of Qurtubi here, Rahimahullah, is to do with the actual mother. 
but there are other terminologies used for uh, or usages of the word mother, as we'll see in a second. Coming to the term def, the, uh, of motherhood, al umuma, right? Al um, that's what al umuma is the concept. Al umuma is the concept of motherhood. In Mu'jim al Wasiyat, the Arabic modern dictionary, it says it is a system, right, in Islam, a system which elevates the status of mothers over the status of fathers in ruling. So it's interesting the definition they're giving, right, when it comes to motherhood, a station, a system, sorry, Nidam. So it's obviously Islamic, which elevates the status of mothers over that status of fathers. Because we know in Islam, motherhood is more virtuous than fatherhood. Not to say that fatherhood doesn't have any place or doesn't have its own uh, fadl, but it's more so the mother, as we'll see, because of the sacrifice she goes through. And the system returns to the mother, and the origin of the system returns to the idea of the mother and the lineage or, or uh, via lineage or inheritance. Hence, the one who's considered a mother then is the one who's your actual mother. So by lineage or grandmother, or as we'll see later, aunt, right? Because they're also going to go there. Uh, or by inheritance, right? So if someone's not your mother going upwards, like the grandmother, it could be your mother to inheritance, like your aunt, right? Even though she's not your mother physically, as Islamically, she has the position of the mother. So all of this allows us to better understand how we can conceive the idea of motherhood. It's a system that is Islamic, that is telling us that the mother is highly valuable, so much so that the mother is more virtuous in her status than the father. That's the idea behind it. And we're going to prove today, inshallah ta'ala, how so. But with that being said, we need to think bigger, right? In terms of when we use this word mother, it can't just be so restricted because in Islam, we understand there are other forms of relationships. Hence, in Islam, there are other usages for the word um, mother, not just the one who gave birth to you. That's the primary one. So some may say, but brother, isn't it against the idea that we only have one mother, right? Someone who gave birth to you. But we said, yes, this is true, that your mother is the one who gave birth to you. This is the primary meaning. But the extension of motherhood and mothers to others who have a relationship connected to that is not negated in Islam. Because again, the Quran and Sunnah are going to tell us who our mothers are and who are who they are not. So in the Quran and Sunnah, there are others who are referred to as mother, as we'll see. But that doesn't mean that if someone right, says that this person, other than their real mom, is their mom, is wrong. For example, in Surah Mujadila, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, In ummahatuhum illallahi waladanahum. Right? Those who are your mothers are only those who give birth to you. So Allah is telling us that those people who say that their wives are mothers, that they're not their mothers. But this is different than what we're going to use. We're saying the one who gave birth to you, Allah says, in Ummahatuhum, that their mothers really are those who who give birth to you. As for those who are your wives, they're not your mothers. This is correct. But there are others who are your mothers, as we'll see here now. All right? Uh, okay, this is another benefit, side benefit, that the term mother comes 17 times in, in singular form in the Quran, 11 times in plural form, according to al Masu'ah. A tafsir and mawdu'i, right? So a lot of beneficial information we'll take from that. So that's a, the, the tafsir that's organized under chapters of topics, right? So topical tafsir. So it's kind of helpful when you want to figure out a topic in the Quran, it tells you all about it. So 17 times and 11 times in the plural form. But let's talk about this, right? This is the part I want to really focus on, which is anwar, the types of ummahat. So before going there, there's a P, there's a master dissertation written by this uh, sister Nimaha Abdullah Umar from Umul Qura uh, called Motherhood. Well, this is a translation of the title. Motherhood and its status in Islam live the Quran and Sunnah. It's more than a thousand plus pages. And it's a useful resource. Uh, a lot of information I've taken from there. Not all, but some uh, of the information. So just to show us that there are, there's been some research done on this topic. Uh, from different angles, right? So obviously some material in there we're going to be taking and it has some value. But in that book, the author, she categorizes motherhood across one, two, three, four, five categories. And it's interesting because now we're opening our eyes to the idea that there is more than one type of mother and they have different ahkam. This is the key. The difference between all these moms is their status, one. And number two, their ahkam, the rulings they receive. Number one, your real mother. She gets the rights of lineage. And lineage is coming through her. 
right? Such that, for example, that you, when you trace your lineage, you trace through her. Well, of course, your dad too. And then also the rights of inheritance, right? So your mom gets inherited from you. The blood money, right? If you were, something happened to you, your mom can receive the blood money on your behalf. Mahramiya, she's your mahram, means this is your blood relative, right? Uh, so obviously, for us, that means Baharami is very important because it can establish through Nasab or Sahar, as we'll see, or, right? Or through uh, uh, breastfeeding, right? Rada'a. Guardianship, right? Because the moms have the right to Hadana, right? By guardianship, if there's a custody issue. And then it says good treatment, and you cannot marry them. Well, it's a hurma. You cannot marry your mother, of course, that's considered absolutely prohibited. So look at the rights the real mother receives or the others. They have less rights. Showing us in Islam, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to refer to others as mothers, he doesn't take away from the rights of those right, who have a status but not the same. The one who gave birth to you is a real mom. This is the one who really does the work for you, right? Caring you, right? giving birth to you, nursing you, doing the tarbiyah. As for the next category, we have what's called the spiritual mothers, right? In, in a sense, you, you can think about them as... Uh, Ruhi, you know, that's not the very best word to use. If Probably a better one is to use terms like the a religious. I mean, I'll translate it better. The religious mother, which is uh, the wives of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they are our mothers, right? And this is important because you can't deny this. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala mentioned in Surah Hazab that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is like a father to us. Not, not literally, but as a father figure, as a religious figure. And then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. He says, وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَا تُهُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَا تُهُمْ And their mothers are your, their wives are, his wives are your mothers. What do they deserve? Good treatment. Of course, they passed away, but still, we have to speak good of them. If they are, when they are alive, they have to be dutiful to them, right? To tell us to do something, obviously, they passed away. But also, we can't marry them, as Allah tells us also in Surah Hazab. So it's interesting, obviously, as Muslims, we recognize this, right? And this is obviously a point that where no one would dispute, of course, against, except from some of the, by those who gone astray, Right, uh, in, in, in the religion, number three is the milk mother. Right, so a mother who didn't give birth to you but has breastfed you during the first two years of your life, and this will establish mahramiyyah. So, this mother will this woman become your mahram, you cannot marry her, and she deserves good treatment and 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 and, and uh, kindness. So, obviously, you can see now the difference between the two because the real mother does a lot of the as we've seen the ayat in the Quran, she's the one who's sacrificing the most. So the rule we always look at in general, more rights and responsibilities, they go together, right? Rights and responsibilities. But we also know that when someone goes through more or does more or has to suffer more or endure more, then obviously their status goes up. And when someone's status goes up, so are the, so are the, the rights that they receive, as we'll see later. So this is very interesting because Islam is fair and just. In the Western system, we don't recognize any of these, right, as mothers, right? And this is a sad reality of our systems. That we think about things literally, and even the mother, we don't give the rights, right? Subhanallah, in this, in this society we're in. So, milk mother right, has a status, right? Then there's the, when we talk about religious mother, wives of Prophet, وسلم, they're our real mother, then the aunt. So, the aunt is a type of mother in the sense that she can take the place or she has that status, right? Because Nabi, وسلم, when he talked about this, obviously, scholars they discuss on which, in which grounds. And which in scenarios is the aunt like the mother? Is it, is it in totality or is it in cases where there is custody issues, etc., or like this, right? So obviously there's a, a scope. But the fact that there is relationship to your mother, right? Number one, right? So the aunt on your father's side, right? Or on your mom's side. But of course, we look at the hadith, uh, it's coming on the and with the wording al khalatu, you mean zilat al um, the khala, the Mother, the aunt, sorry, is in the position of, of the, of the mother, and so this teaches us that number one, the right, the 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 the, the maternal aunt, she, has a particular status, not just of mahram, but also the, and you can't marry her, but also the good treatment, the dutifulness and time kingship, and when there's custody issues, that also her situation can bring brought in. Uh, and this is what the early they discuss when it comes to um, who can take uh, the child if there's an issue of custody or absence of parents. In any case, right, this is interesting, right? Because when we look at this hadith, many of us will be like, oh, subhanAllah, right? That's uh, a very interesting right, thing because in the Western world, there'd be someone to say that that's my aunt 
I treat her like a mom in some ways. Right? They, they, people wonder, like, what do you mean by that, right? And obviously, like we said, it's not the same because look how many more rights there are here. Uh, but here we're saying that there are respect for that. And the last one, the foster mother, not adopted mother. Foster mother is the one who takes care of you when you're young and your mother entrusts them or a person who takes care of you when your mom is not present or she passed away. An example for Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Umm Ayman. Right? Her name is Baraka. Anha. And Umm Ayman, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved her deeply. She was an Ethiopian in background. His name is Zahabi mentions in Sierra Alam and Nubala. And her status is well known. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she raised him until the day he died. He had so much respect for Umm Ayman. Right? Until the, even the ulama after, interesting story in Tabaqat Ibn Sa'ad, that one day, a man was brought forth to the courts, Islamic courts, at the time of the Salaf, at the time of the Salaf, time of Tabi'un, and he was uh, held accountable for referring to the son uh, of Baraka, so Umm Ayman's son. He called her the son of Baraka. They didn't call her Umm Ayman. So the Qadi asked him, why do you call him, call him that? You know Umm Ayman and her status. And the only reason maybe you use that terminology is to belittle him. So he, he ordered him to be given a ta'zir, a punishment. Allahu Akbar. Why? Because Umm Ayman is the foster mother of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't call her by her first name. You were trying to make tanakus. You're trying to lower her, her status. You know, the stories like this, narrations like this, you're not going to find any tradition. Why right, really? Except for Islam. And let alone the mother. Right? The foster mother, how highly they, they're held. Again, they deserve good treatment, dutifulness, and tying the, ties the kingship. With all this being said, this gives us now a better image uh, of the idea of, of motherhood. But the real focus for today's lesson and lecture is the first one. Because these is, this is the one that most of us are interested in. And we need to be, need to, uh, be uh, more uh, aware of. And obviously because our real mothers have the most rights over us. طيب, moving along. The virtues of motherhood in Islam. At Umumah in Islam, this idea of motherhood is highly virtuous. And because of the time, I can't mention a lot of them, but we mentioned just three of the major ones. Because motherhood is something in today's society has been challenged. Most of us are aware that the Western society has really put uh, serious, right, uh, not doubts, I would say, or rather say uh, uh, criticisms, uh, discouragement for motherhood, such that many women today uh, are not looking forward in the Western society to be mothers. Right. Recently, I was reading before starting this lecture, a peer research, there was some uh, survey done uh, recently, and a lot of the women, more than even than men, more women, unlike uh, than men in the U.S., were saying that they did not want to become mothers. They were not looking forward to it because of all the difficulty that they imagined that was going to come with it versus the men who were who had more desire to be fathers because they perceived fatherhood to be easier. And this is something very important to think about because this also shows you the remnants and traces of feminism in our societies, that, that motherhood with the highest status a possible woman can be is being thought of as difficult and uh, very, um, you know, uh, unappealing um, compared to things like careers and, you know, jobs, etc. And even though these two ideas are not mutual, right, you can, someone can be both, as we'll see examples, but this is our society we live in. So in Islam, we, we want to talk about the motherhood, the, the virtues of it. Because yes, it's difficult, but there comes high reward. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks of parents, mothers and fathers, he mentions their right and their status after his own, right, right to worship. Showing us that they're the people who have amongst the highest stations, right, amongst the people after, of course, the prophets and messengers, right, are right, the mothers. In fact, many of the prophets and messengers, right, are fathers and they have wives who are mothers. So no doubt, if somebody's status is this high, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions their rights. Why is their right so high, except that their status is so high, and therefore the reward that comes with it is going to be tremendous, more so than what anyone can do. Allah ta'ala, So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us not only that he deserves to be worshipped sincerely without any partners alone, and to be good to your parents, Right, till the end of the verse. So when we look at the translation, and that you and the Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him, and that you be dutiful to your parents. This part here we're going to see is part of the responsibilities that children have to the parents. And if both of them or one of them, one of them or both of them attain old age, you in life see not the word of suspect, nor shout at them by just him in terms of honor. And this is something where Islam is so explicit. Right, that it doesn't allow right, children 
to have some kinds of unclarity about their rights. The parents have highlights, and of course, between the mother and the father, look at what says, the mother over the father. Number two, motherhood brings great respect and status to women. In fact, it's it's very interesting because if a woman were to ask herself, what's the highest status or I could possibly gain? Of course, individually, from the good deeds you can do in your own piety, you can reach the status of uh, siddiqa, right? Being a level of a truthful person, like Maryam alayhi, alayhi salam, or uh, may, Allah be, may please be her and have peace upon her. Uh, because Allah says that she was a siddiqa, truthful in her iman and her actions and her belief in Allah. But now, if we think about Maryam, her own piety plus the fact that she's the mother of Isa, and she raised Isa, who is an Ul Azim and Rusul. It's khair upon khair because now the good that she's done herself is transitive. It's gone over to her, her son. And we'll see that motherhood is the difference between motherhood and individual khair is that motherhood is a woman going and giving up a lot of her time and energy to raise another person, children, yani, who will then do good and the reward will come back to her. So it's transitive khair, right? something which is muta'addi, goes beyond right? just a person. Versus something which is passive, limited to you. And this is important because in today's time, like I said, if people are asking us, what's the benefit of motherhood? Then we have to say that what's better, right, that you could do where you do good beyond your own self, right? Isn't that the, the, the best of good that you can do? Charity, uh, uh, encouraging people, right? uh, uh, raising people, right, uh, uh, developing people. Right? This is what all of us are trying to do. But in today's world, in you know our, our society, um, people are not interested in that because they think it's difficult. But we say doing your own piety is good, but this is greater than what you can do. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, and we have enjoined on a man to be dutiful and good to his parents. His mother bore him weakness, hardship upon weakness and hardship, and his winning is two years. Give him give thanks to me and to your parents, on to me is the final destination. So here Allah subhanahu wa telling us about the mother and why her status is so high. Because she's done all this difficulty. Difficulty in, in having the pregnancy, difficulty in delivering the child, uh, difficulty in nursing the child. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledging all that, that's why the scholars say that she has three over one when three over one when it comes to the to the to the the piety or sorry, the dutifulness. So the description Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us is very important. And then the next ayah in Surah Qaf Allah mentions uh something similar. Right? So here when we look at this, we need to then Think about why people, when they say that motherhood is not as appealing or difficult, what they're really forgetting is that anything that comes with a high status or reward requires struggle and sacrifice. Otherwise, it's not worthy itself of being something to aspire to. It's like saying today in our society, which is kind of a criticism as well against the feminist ideas, as if to say that getting a high-paying career and occupation is easy. It's not. right? And that's the problem we have today on our society. We tend to glorified idea of getting careers and but most people don't have careers most people have jobs if you look at the data you can see that the idea of a job versus a career and an idea of a career with advancement and has advancement and has all this money that's not what everybody has people have jobs but here we are today saying that yes become a career woman over a mother as if the other one is easy and this one is hard and so it's already a false dilemma that we need to help deprogram people's men the minds um okay the next one is to do with the fact that, and here's a nice tafsir of Katir, he says the mother bears him with hardship, which means that the mother suffers hardship because of her child. So there's fatigue, sickness, vomiting, heaviness, distress, and other forms of hardship that a woman, a pregnant woman suffers, and she delivers him with hardship, means he also lives in hardship and suffers the pain, labor, and severity. So the scholars say then, the first hardship is to do with the pregnancy, the second one, the delivery, and third one, the nursing. Right, and so because of these difficulties, the mom's status goes up. So we see difficulty brings reward. In the desire, the severity, the, the intensity of the rewards with the intensity of the other suffering, and this is important as we'll see later. Motherhood is also a cause for paradise, and there's nothing then more encouraging than that. That if someone wants to increase their chances of going to paradise, then being a parent is amongst those ways, as long as they're doing their best, right, and they're doing their responsibilities. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he says. May he be cursed or disgraced. May he be disgraced. May he be disgraced. Whose parents, one or both of them, attained old age during his lifetime. And he does not enter Jannah, right? Due to being dutiful to them, a Muslim. And this means that if somebody has parents who are old or alive, this is a key to them getting to paradise. But what about the mother specifically? Muhammad ibn, 
Jahmir uh, uh, Sulami, he says here that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to him, this uh, Sahabi, saying that, uh, oh Muslims, I want to go out to fight in jihad, and I've come to ask your advice. And he said, do you have a mother? He said, yes. He says, then stay with her, for paradise is beneath her feet. So this is the correct wording of the hadith. Right, so it's not generalized, it's specified, right? So the scholars, when they discuss this hadith, is different than the famous one, uh, because there's another one just says the paradise under the feet of mother. It's not that word exactly. It's this wording, be dutiful to her, or paradise under her foot, right? And the scholars, they say that her foot doesn't mean just only her. It means in general. And so when the scholars use this terminology, the hadith mentions this terminology, what does it mean, paradise under her foot? Abu Hassan Sindhi, rahimahullah, in his commentary, he says, as Sakhawi, rahimahullah, said, verily humility towards mothers is the cause into paradise. And as yeah, Abu Hassan Sindhi says, it is also possible that he means that your share of paradise will not come to you except through, through here. Or if something is considered under the foot of another person, it means that person has gained possession of it and the other person is not capable of obtaining it except by way of them. So if we were to interpret the hadith incorrectly, a person cannot really get to paradise if they, without being dutiful to his mother. This is what the hadith is trying to tell us. And if you think about that then, it's very powerful because a mother who's sacrificing so much, if her children can go through paradise only through her obedience or dutifulness to her, and of course to the Lord first and foremost, um, what about her own status entering paradise? Right. What about the du'as they're making for her? What about her own piety? Of course, this will also be for her a means to paradise. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clearly showing that the mother here specifically, because the battle this man wanted to go to, right? Uh, Jahima, he was trying to go to a battle. This is not the Fard Ain one. This is a recommended one. Because we know the difference between the one which is recommended a battle, which is necessary, Muslims are in danger. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi telling him something better. Right? Fal Zimha, right? Go and hold fast to her obedience. So paradise underneath her foot. And this is enough, right? Recommendation not only for someone to know that a mother receives that kind of level of status, but the children to also know that our the mothers, our mothers, they're not people who we should be disrespecting or being undutiful to, despite the reality that we know that most people. Right, whether it be Muslim or not Muslim, are not maybe doing their best towards their mothers as they're supposed to. So this is just summary of it. There's more, of course, evidences, but we'll move on towards the next one. So if motherhood is a high and lofty station, very virtuous, uh, motherhood is natural, right? And this is another thing that if someone today were to say, well, it's not like we have a shortage of mothers compared to, right? The hadith that tell us about the virtues. I mean, there are people who already become mothers, like it or not, because it's human nature. And this then leads to the question about the maternal instinct. Uh, some data has come and studies showing that the idea of the maternal instinct, that women have a burning desire and a know-how to be mothers, is actually not something established. Right? There's some data that try to show that it's a myth. And, of course, it's problematic if someone were to confuse the, the idea of the maternal instinct for the fact that most women... We love to become mothers, right? So how do we understand that data? Well, those studies are saying that women's knowledge of being mothers come about one week before or after her pregnancy. And women learn how to be mothers on the job. So it's something which you have experience, makes you better at it. And that knowledge goes as the time goes on when the child is born, etc. So if the understanding of maternal instinct is understood this way, then of course a mom... A woman wanted to become a mother, it's natural. But her being a good mother, that requires knowledge and experience. See the difference? Today, the data is telling us it's, it's as if it's a, a myth. Nobody wants to be a mother. And this is not true, right? Most women would love to be, but our society doesn't allow it. And we spoke about that in our feminist uh, feminism classes before, that our society wouldn't even allow this because it's considered in our society uh, the lower option. So we're going to say that, in fact, Allah created women to be not only mothers, that is something natural, part of their trajectory in life. And the proof for this, I'm going to show that Allah created the woman physically, psychologically, to become mothers and the fact that they want to be. And this is important. They want to be mothers and they're built to be mothers. That's the key. So if someone were to tell us today, well, I don't feel that internal instinct. I don't think it's real. 
Well, tell me, even if somebody doesn't have that instinct necessarily, or as we said, it comes later on that I know how of it. Somebody wanting to have a family is definitely natural, but also the fact that you were built, you were created. A woman was created to, do, to, to, to be a mother. Look at the first example, women yearn. This is what we're trying to show. And the proof for this, we're going to use the two prophets, uh, two, sorry, pious women, Sarah, the wife of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. Both of them did not have children at one point in life in terms of Sarah to later on, and Asiya, not at all, according to the historians. So Sarah, when she didn't have a children, because Hajra got Ismail first, she became jealous. Well, Sarah became jealous of Hajra because she didn't have any children, and Hajra quickly gave birth to, to Ismail. And later on, she was given uh, the blessing of, of having uh, Ishaq. And here's the ayah, right? The ayah in Surah Hud, when she was amazed by, by the glad tidings given to her by the prophets. And that's why, why she couldn't believe right, that they were giving her this glad tidings because she's old, old age. But also the fact that that's what she desired, right, all along. So what we take from this is the fact that the jealousy, because Hadith Bukhari talks about the jealousy, and that's one of the reasons. If someone didn't know, one of the reasons why Hajra moved to to Mecca, why Ibrahim took Hajra and Ismail to Mecca, Hadith Bukhari tells us because of the issues that were uh, coming between the two, and we talked about this more in elevating this uh, uh, sisters or women's class. We talk about her their biography, Sarah, in that angle. I'll talk about it more there. So Sarah wanted to have a children. Later she got it. As for Asya, she never had. So she, what did she do? She took in Musa alayhi salam. And it's interesting because when you see uh, how she saw, as soon as she saw Musa, that's what she wanted. She wanted to take him in to raise him because she didn't have any children. And the fact that she saw Musa as a child, who not only, of course, grows up to be Musa, but the fact that, that what was the instinct that she wanted? Why did she feel that need? And this is what we're trying to prove in the Quran. As soon as she saw, of course, Firaun is killing the children, right? He, this is, but this, here we have Hasya taking in right, a, a, a child and saying to, to, to Firaun not to kill him, right? Don't kill him. When she saw the, the child of Musa, she considered him something of a, an, like a, the coolness of the eyes for her and, and a comfort for her and Firaun. And she said, don't kill him. Perhaps he'll be a benefit for us. Or we may adopt him as a son. So I, I believe then that definitely the idea of women wanting children and a family eventually is something I mean, definitely in the Quran and the Sunnah. And that leads then to the second point that women menstruate. And part of the idea of menstruation is preparation for childbirth, right? And so here we have the ayahs Arunaka and al Mahir, they ask you about menstruation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the rulings of menstruation, but the Muscalas they explain. The concept of it, right? So when they ask you to be something about menstruation, say it's a harm, I need the blood of it when it's coming out. So stay from the woman during that period until the end of the verse. Even Qudam and Mughni cites Allah created menstruation for the wisdom of child development. So today in our society, it's very important, especially for uh, the doubts of the feminists and those who've been who taken on these ideas. They're going to come and say, like we said, there's no maternal instinct. I don't have that feeling. What to them, what's the benefit of menstruation? You think uh, you were built for no uh, for no purpose? What is this monthly cycle right that we have? So clearly, Muqaddam writes: if a woman becomes pregnant, the blood stops. Uh, sorry, becomes nourishment for the child by the permission of Allah. So like this, a pregnant woman does not menstruate when she gives birth. Allah the Exalted changed the blood due to His wisdom to breast milk to nourish a child. So obviously, what we take from this is that the idea Allah created a woman physiologically for motherhood is something that can't be denied, despite the conditioning of our society to tell us otherwise. And this is important because, again, like the, the hikmah behind these rulings and also the fact that, I guess, our society, I mean, I don't even know what, what we, we, we really are going to answer about these points, but I think in our society, we can clearly see the discrepancy between the woman's body and her psychology and emotions, etc. And then the, the reality we live. And that's the third one now. A woman becomes pregnant and gives birth. That's a clear sign that she's ready for mother, pregnancy, or, sorry, for motherhood, that she can actually do it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated it. Uh, it's something very, very easy for a woman to do. Of course, it, it has pain, difficulty, but it's something which is natural because the language Allah uses in Surah Abbas. And this is why the ulama, especially Ibn Qayyim, whoever wants more kalam and speech on this, you can see that he speaks about the wisdom behind childbirth, like many other things he talks about, how childbirth works. And he, and he talks about it, the fact that the child can come out and the way it comes out, head first, instead of the feet and 
Otherwise, the child will become strangled by the umbilical cord. And Bukhayim talks about in his Kitab at Tibyan, Fi Aqsam, or Fi Ayman in the Quran. Uh, and there he talks about this and it's interesting because in our society we know these things through science but we don't think about it, right why, why is it that the child naturally does that and the fact that it's all so easy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Thumma yassara. then we made the path easy for him يعني, to exit by the child for birth so we tell them that these are all signs that motherhood is something which it's not it's just only yearning we're going to see it again as we're seeing that, that, that the mother the woman being becoming a mother is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended for their purpose in creation. Number four, the womb of a woman is capable of expanding for the purpose of birth. And this is even more fascinating. Ibn Qayyim Hiblan, the same kitab at Tibyan, fi Ayman, Ayman al Quran, page 52, he, he mentions right, this point. And some of the Fasilin use this ayah, right? I mean, it's interesting. There's a lot of kalam, kalam, a speech on this ayah, a lot of speech about this verse in Surah Al Ra'ad, chapter 13, ayah number eight. If you check the tafsir, you find multiple tafsirs. What does it mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah ya'lamu ma ta'hamilu kullu untha wa ma ta'ghidu al-arham. Wa ma ta'ghidu al-arham. That part. Allah says, Allah, he knows that which every female gives birth or bears, yani of, of, of a child, right? Of, of, of a child, right? Uh, and by how much the moon falls short. Wa ma ta'ghidu al-arham. Ta'ghidu al-arham, scholars are different. Some say it means increase of the womb, decreasing of it. The increasing of the of the of the pregnancy, the decreasing of the pregnancy. Some will have longer, some have shorter. Some said this. Some so many. Imam uh, Imam Bayan. He mentions many interpretations, all valid. But one interpretation that some have suggested, it's also the fact that the womb contracting and expanding, for the purpose of birth. And even though it's not mentioned necessarily as the ultimate tafsir of it, or it's a possibility. Can I have here, where he says if it's said. How can something like a child, which is exponentially bigger than the womb, exit from it, despite the womb being so tight? And it was said that this is from the greatest evidence of the divine concern of the Lord exalted, his ability and will. For the womb must open very wide for the child to ex exit. More than one from the intelligent people have said that the womb must open with a, a great opening, then contract quickly, quicker than the blink of an eye, and to facilitate birth. But the virtuous doctors and experts have acknowledged that and said that it's not possible except due to divine care, decree, that the minds are unable to understand and as an affirmation of the perfection of the lordship and the ability of the great creator. And Allah is true. Right? These are signs of signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of course, after childbirth, the woman's body returns to original form. And despite all the tearing and the pain and the suffering. So all of this is showing, showing us what? Again, that the natural element. And this is what we need to we need to really think because those who reflect on this will see that, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intending for women to become mothers is in him wanting good for them. It wants good for them, as we'll see, because motherhood is, is their is their way to paradise. And the last one we're going to mention that women's physiology or like terms of, sorry psychology is that she's deep she has deep love, compassion, concern for others, especially her children. And this is a part where in Western society it's a huge problem because here we are masculinizing our society, especially women. Women are always on the masculine side when they go into work and competing, doing tasks which increase testosterone and decrease the estrogen. And oxytocin is going down and all this. And that's why today happiness levels are decreasing, especially amongst women. And if you ask them, well, well, what's going on here, right? Well, women are not in touch with the feminine side. And what are the things that increase our feminine side or these uh, hormones? Right? What about nurturing, right? Tarbiya, love, care, concern. Where do you find that in the workforce? The workforce today is business oriented, right? It's all about bottom line profits, all this stuff. So here we're going to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made women such that that's her natural way. Why? For her to be a good mother. As we look at this example. Mother of Musa. Um Musa, we're going to come back to her example later. As an excellent example of mothers. Um Musa, may Allah be pleased, be pleased with her. She, she had deep compassion for Musa when, when Allah told her to put him in the well, sorry, the sea, and not to be aware, afraid we're going to return him back to you. But look how Allah describes her, her fear. Again, the mother's plight. And the heart of the mother of Musa became empty, Allah says. Empty. She was near to, to disclose his case had it not been strengthening his heart. She was going to tell others that it was her child out of so much sadness and, and inability to let go of, of Musa. But Allah assured her and she trusted Allah. That's the amazing part. She trusted Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this situation of Musa. The scholars, they comment on it. The fact that her heart went to that level. So what's the benefit behind this? The way that she felt for her son, Musa, alayhi salam, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that the natural way a woman is with her children and even beyond, even if she doesn't have children, she has those, those qualities. Ibn Kathir, he writes in his tafsir, Allah tells us how when her child was lost in the river, the heart of Musa's mother became empty. She could not think of any other matter in this world except Musa. And this was mentioned by Ibn Abbas, Ibn Mujahid, Ibn Ikramah, Sa'id, Ibn Jubair, etc. And Ali says also, because the intensity of her grief, she almost told people that she had lost a son. She had disclosed her situation if Allah, if Allah had not given her strength and patience. So that would have been an even bigger child, trial. But of course, her iman was so strong. She did as Allah told her and she kept patient. And Allah returned him as he promised. We also take now a look at, outside of just this example, Abu Huraira reports, وسلم, he said, the best women among the camel riders, and the women who ride camels, which is the quality of the Arab, right? So the best women of the Arab, because the Hadith of Hurairah is saying Arab, women who ride camels are Arab. Because Abu Hurairah said another, in the end of the narration that Maryam is from Bani Israel and they don't ride camels. Okay, so this Hadith to be contextualized. The best women of the Arab are the Quraysh. Why? The righteous among the women of Quraysh are those who are kind to their king, young ones, and who took a look after their husband's property. The benefit we take, the kind to the young ones. This is the quality Allah gave them. So this means that women, women they have this quality, the Quraysh have it more so amongst the Arab, and Nabi Sallallahu praised it. But now I want to extend beyond this. Hadith of Huraira we all hear about. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a woman has been created from the rib. Right? We all know this is Hadith. And we hear it, and sometimes we misunderstand this Hadith. Because people may say it the wrong way. The Ulema interprets Hadith more than one way. She will not be straightened for you in any way. So if you wish to benefit by her, benefit with her crookedness, while crookedness remains in her. So we all heard this hadith of the rib. And the kuffar have come today and said, look at this hadith. What is this hadith? Women are crooked. What is this iwaj in the woman, this crookedness? Imam Ibn Hubayra Salafi, Rahimullah al Hanbali, he writes, as Ibn Hubayra is well-known imam for the Hanbali Madhab, also Salafi, he writes, and, and, and he's in, in, in Ipsah and Ma'ani al-Sihah. The one of the interpretations of crookedness is hunu, compassion, tenderness, and love and sympathy. Allahu Akbar. Women in this hadith is a praiseworthy quality, not a negative, according to one interpretation. Again, there's more than one interpretation. And look what he says elsewise. He says it's the kindness and compassion which is required in relation to dealing with your young children. Now we have an interesting point. If, if our mother, Hawa, was created Right, how I was created from the rib of Adam السلام, until and she was created with this crookedness. And later on, of course, all women. What does the crookedness mean? One interpretation is this. So if this is one of the interpretations given, the woman has deep compassion, right, and care. What is it for? And so in Western society, when they push women towards careers and not for motherhood, I have a, we have a serious question on the table. When do women exercise their motherly instincts? Where in the in job market and value do we find anyone who has seen because they always talk about but we can't really actualize it the motherly intent and the maternal instinct and no you can't find it so women are losing those qualities in favor of masculine qualities and here we go again comparing men to women what is it that women are not like women men and here's the problem with feminism the standard is always the men and when you compare women to men what do you do you lose and you you cheapen right womanhood so motherhood is actually something natural from all these angles and the question, obviously, then, is that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so natural, why? Because of its high status. And the fact that women who become mothers and who do a good job in that and strive for it, Allah will give them reward. They cannot be enumerated. Uh, due to time, we've got to move a little quicker, uh, which is the qualities of successful motherhood. In order for a woman to be a good mother, as we said, there's things that she has to learn. There's qualities beforehand and qualities while she's a mother. Here, again, the author of this master distinction, Maha Abdullah Omar, she mentions four overarching qualities. Of course, there are more, but these are some of the most important ones. Number one, choosing a good spouse. And that cannot be understated because they have to be on the same page. right? And we spoke about in our parenting classes and work, how that works right? in terms of parenting together, right? on the same page, same wavelength, same understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, same kind of level of our worldview. But so even when it comes to marriage and choosing a spouse, it has to be from the beginning because this is the goal. Number two, both spouses must carry the responsibility of parenthood, both. So this is one of the challenges that sometimes the mother is given my right, lion's share of the of the tarbiyah, right? She's doing a lot of the 
of the raising children at home because fathers are busy working, the husbands are busy. And this could also create then a problem because if they're not sharing it, as the Sharia tells us what they're supposed to do. When we say sharing means there's masuriya that the Sharia is giving each part, party. If that's not happening, then of course, motherhood is going to become more difficult. In fact, the mother may not be able to become or achieve the successful uh, motherhood because she's overwhelmed. She's doing two jobs. So it's very important, the same page, and both holding their weight. The third one, getting married early, early and preserving the emotional health of both parents. And she talks about how early marriages and, and children earlier time and also allows them to have more time to flourish and to raise the children properly at the strength of their, of their age, but also the fact that they both require right that balance, as we'll see. We're going to talk about the emotional health. They both have to be stable. They both have to have the ability right, to be raising the children in a healthy way. So, of course, the relationship between the parents and the relationship between the children. And the last one, the unity of the family it has to be preserved. There has to be the unity of the family and growing the family. So if these qualities are there, along with, of course, the divine guidance and success from Allah, sincerity, dua, so many other things, it's going to make the uh, mother successful. And again, it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If somebody does their best, then they did their job. The outcome of a child is not the measuring stick for the success of a parent. The reason why we're saying that is because we know many parents who work hard, did their best, and the child became corrupted outside their control. And the fact the child chose to, it's the same way the Prophet and Messenger والسلام, have that challenge. Nuh alayhi salam his son, right? And, and no one can come today and say that, that Nuh was not a good parent, right? And this is the point where sometimes parents, they, they get very upset with themselves or they may feel that they're, especially mothers, are doing less of a job. The question is, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're trying your best and then within, the, within the, the boundaries of your capacity, then you're, you're, shallow, you're, you're doing your mas'uliyah. But if you're falling short in that, yes, then that's where the concern comes. And of course, we don't have time, but otherwise this itself requires a greater discussion and research in terms of uh, how can that be achieved in today's world? Because as we know, time progresses and more and more challenges putting being put onto, um, onto the mothers, right? And and then we imagine. Moving on to the rights and responsibilities. And this is the point where in order to really understand motherhood in Islam is to understand that there's rights she owes, she's owed and responsibility she's owing. And in Islam, we believe in both. There's huquq or wajibat. And it's before I continue, it's important to conceive the Islamic idea of, of rights. And in Islam, you're not owed a right just in a vacuum or without without context. For when there are rights, there are also duties, right? So this is why if you study this topic, rights and duties, you'll see rights and duties, they go together. It's not rights in a vacuum. Someone just giving rights and there's no duties. And this is one of the problem, problematic conceptions of Western rights theories, right? The theories of, of rights and because they just establishing rights in a vacuum with no reciprocating or corresponding duty. So think about that. And later on, of course, this is something that requires itself a, a serious uh, research. But it just to make it easy, the more status something has or someone has, the more rights is going to be afforded, but also responsibilities that are going to come with it. And this is interesting because in our society, where again, we, we're focusing heavy on rights. We love the concept of rights, rights, rights. But then if someone tells you mothers have lots of rights and duties, Hence, now when people are saying, I don't know about motherhood, you see, when people hear about motherhood's duties, like, oh, I have to do all this? This is a lot. We tell them, you also get a lot, right? So if, to get a lot, you got to give a lot, right? Isn't that how it goes in life? But what's interesting, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how many rights he has over the ummah? Also, how many responsibilities he had over the ummah, or for the ummah? And that's where you can see in his own personal rights. Let's so give one example. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because of all the ibadat he used to do, and other responsibilities he had personally. And Allah gave him wajibat that are personal, uh, only for him, specific to him. And that's one of the reasons why he has more, more wives and families than others. You see, it's very important. When people today coming and they're saying, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why does he have so many wives? What's the problem? Looking at the rights and divorcing from the responsibilities. But I explained that, that it's one of the reasons why. So just to have that idea in the back of your head is very important. Rights with duties. They go together. What are the rights of the mothers? What are mothers owed? So, because it's high status, right? She comes with, she gets a lot of, of rights. Number one, uh, being dutiful to them. My right? children have to be dutiful to their parents and treat them with ihsan. And this is for both spouses, uh, sorry, both parents, 
But the mother gets more. Hadith of Huraira, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man asked him, who is more entitled to be treated with the best companionship? So when we look at this hadith, we know as a famous hadith that this is for the mothers, right? He said, your, your mother, then he said, who's next? He said, your mother, then who's next? He said, your mother, then who's next? He said, your father. So when scholars explain this hadith, um, they talk about the fact that the mother gets all this because of what the mother does, right, for the child that the father can't do, right? So if someone were to say the three in one, is because, number we said again, the scholars explained, it's because, number one, she gave more, uh, she uh, uh, was pregnant with him, so she obviously she carried him, then the childbirth and the nursing. So three things that she does over the father, who, when after that period he's raising it. And some, of course, they mentioned, of course, the father comes next because he also has hukuk. So look at this hadith and think about that status, that the mother, she has so much dutifulness due to her. Scholars then go into the conversation. If there is a conflict between mother's dutifulness, a parent child being dutiful to a mother or a father, which one takes precedence or preference is a difference of opinion. But the jumhur, the majority of the say, after the fact, they say that if it cannot be reconciled such that each party is giving their hukuk, or each is giving dutifulness, or each party is satisfied, that if it's only to choose one, the jumhur says it's the mother over the father. That's the jumhur position. Of course, other positions as well. But just to show you again the mother's status, because ummuk, thumma ummuk, thumma ummuk, your mother, your mother, your mother. And this is our deen. Another hadith, bin Majah, hadith bin Mithdad, bin Ma'adi Karab, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah enjoins you to be dutiful to your mother. Allah enjoins you to be dutiful to your mothers. Allah, and then he enjoys to be dutiful to your fathers. So why again, why is again, this idea of mothers? So scholars say, why specify mother here and not the father or father at the end? Because the idea behind it is that whoever does more for the child, the status is higher, they deserve more of that. So the father is not out of it because there are hadith just for the father too, but the mother, right? There's conversation with the mother. So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, in Allah, verily Allah, you see kum, he's enjoining you, bi ummahatikum. And then this version says twice. The riwayah in, in, in Maj and others says thalathan, three. Why? Because it goes back to this one, three. Your mother, your mother, your mother. So three times, right? And so here we can already see dutifulness, ihsan. And this is one of the greatest things a mother can have, that her child is religiously obligated to be good to her, or whether it be daughter or son, the whole of their life. Not like in our society, guys, where it's unfortunately that once a month, once a year, we bring a gift, right, for our founders and Mother's Day, not Muslims do, sorry, and they say that's enough, or they barely keep contact with them. This is not sufficient. On top of that, number two, she gets humility and submission towards her. You have to be humble in front of her. You have to listen to her. You have to have mercy, right? Whether she's old or she's young, right? you have to listen to your mom, but also be kind to her. And so here, Allah, in the same ayah we mentioned earlier, Surah Al Isra, ayah 23. So Allah is talking about lowering the wings. Kaos, that means humility towards your, your mother and father, both, but obviously the mother in this scenario. We're talking about the mother. Thirdly, being lenient towards them. So then Allah says, if one or both of them at any age, do not say to them a word of suspect or shout at them, but address them in terms of, of honor. So all of this, it goes together. So of course there is ihsan, walbir, tawadu'i, humble, humility. And the fourth one, ta'a, obedience. And we said already that if there's a conflict in ta'a, who gets more, of course, is supposed to be giving both parties the hukuk. But the mother, see, the mothers, and in our society knows that, and the children know that. They're not giving their due respect. Okay? And, and because when it comes to uh, children, especially the boys, they know they're scared of the, the father more so. So they typically are going to be a little bit more uh, cautious. But for the moms, you know, they know she has excessive love and kindness and mercy. So sometimes they're going to play to their advantage. And this is not uh, something right good for children to do, but they have to understand right that their moms, how much they love them. So obedience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that if it's not something of shirk, kufr, haram, treat them and live, strive, right? Yeah, sorry, live with them, behave with them kindly. And then the hadith, 
Um, uh, I, forgot, actually, I forgot to put the hadith on, on, the, on the thing, so I have to put it later in there. But the hadith we're talking about uh, is the hadith where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he talks about the disrespecting mother specifically. Right, so there's two hadith, one about disrespecting fathers, but the hadith I'm going to put later in the notes, hadith Abu Huraya Mughira, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, so Mughira radiallahu ta'ala narrates, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah harrama alaykum uququl ummahat. Okay, this is the hadith focusing on hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. Uququl ummahat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited for you disobedience to the Mothers, okay. So why mothers is mentioned here? This is what Imam Nawawi is commenting, commenting on. Rahimullah. He says he mentions that it's a major sin. The fact that mothers are only mentioned because the inviolability, right, the sacredness towards the mothers and the, the status and protection is more emphasized in inviolability of fathers. So like that, the Prophet ﷺ said, when asked who deserves most dutifulness, which is the hadith of a mother, and look what he says here and highlighted. And also because disobedience occurs mostly towards mothers. And he says, children desire to obtain things from them more. And as Sadiq Hasakhan, his Sirat Wahad, Sharh Muslim, he says, or due to their weakness in most cases. Pay attention to this point. From the signs they judgment, we know Hadith Jibril, that the, there's going to be, right, mothers give birth to the masters. Why mothers all the time? Because the children, knowing the nature of the mom, they disrespect them more because they try to get what they want from them due to the mom being so soft or sometimes more weak, and it weakens in terms of love for the children they have. And this will also show us then, Islam says no to that, that the children should not try to take, take advantage of the mother's love for them as a time of weakness, but also the fact that our society, mostly, and this is a very important fact now, if we understand this point, that when we have the growing problem of single motherhood in our society, Muslims included now, then where do you think is going to happen to the tarbiyah of the child. It doesn't mean that single mothers can't raise good children. I'm going to show you examples in a second. I'm talking about the fact that to our today's society, when we have this, especially from the boys more so, even the girls too, but the boys, it only creates more of a difficulty because if the mother's nature is so loving, caring, you know, and generally has this great, you know, you know, love for the children and compassion, but the children will try to exploit. And there's no barrier then, which is the father. And this is what the books to talk about in psychology and research. The father's job, a job is for that, the boundary setting. Then we have the problems that we have today. And not to say it cannot be overcome, as we'll see. But just think about that for a second. So Alhamdulillah, Islam says no. Right? If, even if a child knows this, right? They have to know also, don't try to take advantage of your mother's love for you. She loves you more than you love you yourself, right? And But you shouldn't be like that. And that then goes over to the responsibilities, why do you bad mothers have with the children? Number one, breastfeeding the child. Get eye in there. By the ayat there, and Musa also, Aisha's mother, she suckled him and then she gave back the child to Asia and the household of Firaun. And again, we talked about the ahkam of breastfeeding in the parenting guide or parenting work, so someone can go there. Ibn Qayyim also, others, they speak about it in detail. And number two, win the child. The child also wean from breastfeeding. That's also a mutual right between parents. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says both mother and father have to agree mutually, right? That they would like to either stop by breastfeeding child at whatever age. So the, the, the benefit here is not, the hat doesn't have to be breastfeeding straight to two years. You have a choice. But the ulama say that Allah mentioned two years because that is the most common or sometimes we can find that evidence showing that usually at that time, Right, children might, might, might not need it anymore, but it can be over two years, as we explained in the parenting work. But the point I want to highlight here is that it's a haq, uh, because Allah says, If both of them want to, to, to wean the child, mutually agreeing, and they mutually agreed and consented, there's no harm in that. But it's not allowed for a parent. One of the other, <clears throat> just to wean the child without permission of the other or not to concern relation of the other. The same way it's not allowed for her, a mother to deny uh, her milk to a child for no real reason and without a substitute, as we explained. Number three, the inaya, the care a mother has for her child. Right, She has to have care. And there's already something built in. right? Because look at Musa again. And she 
you know, be pleased with her. She said to them when she wanted to see what whereabouts of Musa after the, you know, child was located, she told her sister, the oldest her sister Musa, go find out, tell them <clears throat> that I can, you know, uh, suckle the child. I saw a director household who reared him for you, sincerity. So obviously the concern she already had, we already talked about it, she's already built in. And the last one, which is the the, the, the most difficult one, the tarabiyah, that she has to give the child, both her and the, and the father. And again, in parenting, the parenting work, we speak about this in more detail. Oh, yeah, you had the name of the Oh, you believe, save yourself, you found in health are. So four and four, right? So in, again, some may say, are there more rights? Are there more, resp more responsibilities? Arguably, yes. But for our benefit, we can see that they are, right, matchable in some ways, right? For whatever rights, there's responsibilities. And therefore, the true status of motherhood is obtained when the rights of the child, right, are good obtained, and then the rights of the mother are also. And that shows you the beauty of and the balance of our religion. Going forward now, if we understand that that their responsibilities, mothers should obviously then, while they're mothering and while they're, you know, becoming mothers or before the start, to learn about these uh, uh, ahkam. And this is one of the challenges as well uh, of our society, because like we said, if you look at our schooling system, it doesn't obviously it teaches about any of these qualities that are needed or it teaches more about other qualities for employment. At the same time, we should pay attention to the fact that as a society, the role of the mother is so important that if the role of the mother is compromised, like what's happening today, then we're going to have a compromise in, in a situation of society. But the role of the mother is way bigger than society would like to play out to be so much so uh, today, of course, we're we're thinking that we're hearing about all the time the restructuring of society around family. Right? Western society now has learned that thriving in the Western world can only happen. Right, and again, the Eastern world, right, we know about this, but obviously we've been also imp impacted by this uh, dual household or dual income households. We need a stable houses in which there is the tarbiyah happening at home of the mothers, alongside tarbiyah the the cultivation of the fathers. There needs to be a balance. Otherwise, we're going to have children who are raising themselves or children who are missing the emotional and psychological developments. They're not meeting the needs that they need, hence growing up with so many issues because they're missing all the nurturing that they're supposed to get. They're missing the, the breast milk of their mother. They're missing the care and concern. These are serious impacts on children. You can research it about the impact of neglect on a child. But also the bigger problem, which is that motherhood is so valuable, right, that it should not be that we're valuing profit over uh, society and family. Right? Today, we can see the shortening work week, work week remote work, right? the idea of even bringing in uh, more and more child care services. Uh, why is this Western society looking towards this? Because they're realizing the motherhood is more worth more than we can give value to. Not to mention, of course, the cost, as you mentioned before, that motherhood, if it was to be given, made a job, it, it deserves a six-figure six salary. One study I was looking at said $115,000 a year a mother should be getting per year for the work she does. Of course, we know it's even more than that because her work will get to Jannah. Which leads us to the final segment, really, right? Which is to do with the examples. And this is one beginning example, Um Hani, radiyallahu ta'ala anha. I look at this example of the of our great pious predecessor, Sahabiyat. She came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day saying, Ya Rasulullah, you are more beloved to me than my hearing and my seeing. The right of the husband is great, but I fear that if I turn towards my husband, that I'll fall short in some of my, okay, sorry, she says some of my, yeah, some of my and my child's affairs. And if I turn towards my child's affairs, I'll fall short in the right of my husband. So how look at the dilemma. She's worrying about balancing the relationship with the husband and the relationship with the children. Very realistic in today's time, common concern. Right, mothers, when they become mothers, they worry about the children, they forget the husband. And they worry about the husband, they're going to forget the children. So what does she say? Rasulullah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, barely the best women. He praised them, right? And that's and this is, Shaykh Al-Bani brings this Sahihah to show the backstory of the hadith. Barely the best women to ride on the back of the camels, the right to Quraysh. They are faithful to the children when they're young and the best guardians for the husband's properties. So look what Um Hani was concerned with. I want to be the best mother for, for my children and the best wife for my husband, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was so happy with those words, also showing that, again, that the, the real concern for women is the balance, but also shows us that if these role models exist in our past, our sisters can look up to them, because we need to look at motherhood beyond theory and with the application. So what time is remaining? Quickly, I'm going to mention a number of examples 
of great mothers in the past. And this just is a small sample from the many that we can mention. Bismillah. We said Umm Musa, my male please her and grant her my all goodness. She's considered the epitome of trust in Allah. The epitome, Imam al Qayyim says, of what? Of tawakkul wa thiqatun billah. She's the epitome of trust and confidence in Allah. Here are the ayat in Surah Qasas. And then her virtues. Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin mentions after these ayat that the verses clarify. I should say clarify. The strength of Iman of Umm Musa. And this is from the, her virtues because she threw him into the sea in a boat, right, in a small little box, while her son <clears throat> is in it. And this is something that will not occur except from a true believer. Just think about it for a second and internalize it. Somebody, a mother, putting her newborn in a in a small box or small little container or whatever you call it, like into the water. Because Allah inspired her. That level of trust, it's, it's almost hard to believe, right? Because we know that even after she did this, she was worried. But not because uh, of anything more than the human nature. But the fact is her trust in Allah Ibn Qayyim, he writes in Madad al after he brought the chapter on Musa, he says, when Allah brings the eye, he says, for verity, what she did here is the very essence of having confidence in Allah the Exalted. That's the essence, he says. If it was not for the completeness of her confidence in Allah, she would not have thrown her child to her prized position in the stream of water to be played with by the waves and current to where it would land or stop. Just imagine, right? And this is the beauty of our religion that we have women who are this strong. Because our conception of mother, women in Islam are strong when it comes to their character and their faith in Islam and also virtuous. And she's strong and she has fadila or fadai, right? She has uh, these qualities. She's fadila, she's virtuous. So this is a beautiful example. Uh, we spoke about it in the elevating class. Elevating our sister, we spoke about her biography more. So that's beautiful. And to remember her as an example, when, you, when you're feeling worried or down, or mother's feeling like, I don't know what I'm doing, and things aren't going right, just remember the strength of Iman and trust in Allah. If Musa, how much he put trust in Allah, and Allah brought him back as he promised, you put your trust in Allah, if you're doing the right thing, Allah will take care of your child. Allah is the best of preservers. Next, the mother of Umm Hayd al-Hulayfa bin Iman, anhu, a sincere advisor, when Allah pleases her. Hulayfa narrates himself the Hadith Sahih Tirmidhi. My mother asked me once, right, when is the last time you met with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Look at this, look at this mother. Well, she's focused on his deen. And he said, I haven't seen him since, since such and such time. So she rebuked me and said, so I said to her, let me go to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so I pray Maghrib with him. So at the beginning of the Hadith, look at this mother. She's not asking him anything more important than meeting Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, getting the the knowledge, the amal, the dua. So she's asking him and he's telling her, oh, I didn't really go recently. And so she's, this is a beautiful example. This is what a mother should be doing for her children, always reminding them. The same with many mothers, they do that. Did you read your Quran? Did you go to the madrasa? Did you go to the class? Uh, you see, sometimes we feel like shy. No, we have to do that because the children, they deserve it. And look what happens then. Hudayba goes, he said, I came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Maghrib, and I, I, I asked him and she said, go to him. So he said, let me go to my ask forgiveness for me and you. So I went to the Prophet ﷺ and prayed Maghrib with him. Then he prayed until praying uh, until Aisha. So he kept praying two by two all the way till Aisha. Then he turned and I followed him and he heard my voice. He said, who is this? Hulayfa? I said, yes. He said, what is your need? May I forgive you and your mother. He said, indeed, this is an angel that never descends to the earth ever before tonight. He sought permission from his Lord to greet me with the priest and to give me the glad tidings that followed him as the chief of the woman in paradise. And Hassan Hussein are the chiefs to the use of the people of paradise. So he benefited from the hadith. He benefited from the dua of Rasulullah for him and his mother. You see, she's very clever because when she tells him to go to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi she's also looking out for herself. And this is important for moms who feel sometimes that they can't do a lot because they're children. When you send your children to the madrasa to learn the deen, and they're getting hasanat, so are you. So you're never missing out. You're not missing out because whatever they do, you get. And also the benefit we take that sometimes when mothers are feeling that, that they wish to have more time for themselves, yes, they should make time for themselves. But when they're doing whatever they're doing for the children, it is for themselves because we know the children or an extension of her khair. Right? It's a beautiful example of a mother who is looking after the real needs of their of their children, right? So it's important, yes, nothing wrong asking a mother to ask about their child, about their studies. Yes, also very important. How was your studies? But also asked about the deen too, right? Next, Uraya bint Hassan or Hassan, a mother who raised a scholar. Right? Again, I'm going to mention many of those examples now. 
because many of our sisters, this is what they're looking for, right? They're looking for the example of those who raised ulama because this is what we want, right? This is what many mothers want, the sacrificing for their children. So here's an example of a woman who raised a scholar because her herself was so concerned. So this woman, <clears throat> she's a mother of a scholar. Of course, in the beginning, he's not a scholar. She raised him. So it mentions here that her herself was a righteous person, and she came to her son Ismail to one of the scholars of Abdul Warith ibn Sa'id. And Khadir Baghdadi narrates this in her biography, Ismail Muraya, about you know this story, and it's authentic. And this is Wadi'iya, Muhammad Wadi'iya, Habibullah Ta'ala, and Sifat Sifatul Maratu Saliha, she narrates this narration, authenticates it. And she says that when she went to Abdul Warith, this narrator, uh, he says, Uday came to me with her son and said, This is my son who will be with you to take from you good manners. So he Ismail was the most beautiful boy in Basra, and he said, if I pass by sitting of knowledge, I will say to him, go forth. And he go and sit, and then I will come after him to the Muhaddith. And Ibrahim al-Harabi said that he's a narrator from the narratives of Abidullah ibn Aisha, and Ibn Uyayna, and the people of Basra left from there. No doubt that Ismail was from the, right, from those firms who narrated from knowledge. So it starts with the mother. Right? This is the key. It starts with the mom. Uh, of course, right, her story herself, they mentioned that her herself was an honorable, intelligent woman. And how do we know that? Because she encouraged her, her son, to study knowledge, knowing that that is the way that she, she's going to be gaining knowledge. And it's a mom who's doing it. Right? Often we hear about the dads, right, who were doing this, right? But we know in Islam, right, a lot of the scholars raised with single moms. They were raised with single moms. <clears throat> that means then that it's not allowed for a woman to tell herself, that, you know, uh, I can't do this either, right? Especially knowing the situation uh, of, of today's time. That maybe she's divorced, a divorcee, or maybe the, the father passed away, or whatever may happen. Which leads to the next one, right? So that's a beautiful story. Another one, Um Sulaim, right? No example, probably bigger, of a single mother who's so wise, right? A wise single mother. Before she made Abu Talha, after her husband left her and was not Muslim, right? Because we know that her father, her husband, original husband was not Muslim. Anas, my mother came, Um Anas came to, right, Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is important because why is she coming to Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He's saying, as she prepared my lower garment out of half of her headdress, half of her khimar, right? She covered herself with half and, right, uh, with, with so a headdress, and with the other half, she covered my upper body. So she took it, cut it in half, and made a garment for him. And she took him to Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, This is my son, Lace. I brought him for you to for serving you. Invoke blessings for him. Of course, we know that he on a somatic state with um uh, with Rasul Sallallahu for ten years, and then he became a scholar. He made made dua for him to Anas, who very old. He had more than a hundred grandchildren. Became wealthy as well. What's interesting about the story of Um Sulaim, when she noticed that Rasul Sallallahu who is her relative, just by the for information, he is a relative. She brought him to the Sulaim for multi multitude of reasons. Number one, for the dua and the barakah the Sulaim bring to the Anas, right? Number two, right, for her own benefit that she can learn from Anas whatever he learns because obviously he's gonna learn. And some of the narration, number three, some of the narrations show that she brought Anas to the Sulaim, not Abu Talha. Some narrations say that Abu Talha. When she married him later and gave da'wah to Abu Talha too, uh, to Muslim, she gave da'wah to Abu Talha, he became Muslim, and she brought, and Abu Talha said, said, Ya Rasulullah, here's Anas, he's an intelligent boy, can he serve you? But if it's the other way, we look at the other narration, what Umm uh, um Sulaim did herself, as a single mother, she needs her son to have male influence from the family. And who does she pick? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best role model possible, and who was a relative to her, to mentor and raise her son, help raise her son for her. Such that every time Anas would come home, Muslim would ask about his whereabouts, what happened, what he learned. She's learning from it too. And this is what well, a lot of times our society is missing. If there's no male figure in the household, especially for sons, it's important for a, a mother to get that. Uh, we have the madrasa, the imam, in the school, somebody, a Muslim, upright male who can help. Very important because it's not coincidence. Anas later on becomes such a successful story. It's so close to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because of how wise she is. Right? Um, Salim is so, so intelligent. She loved Anas so much because she says in the hadith that I will never get married unless I, to, I will not get married to any man unless Anas is happy with him. Right? And of course, when Abu Talha got proposed, Anas 
according to some narrations, he did the nikah. All right, Allah Akbar. Uh, another example, all right, Um Sufyan al Thawri, a mother who sacrificed, may Allah be merciful for her knowledge. Imagine in Tariq al Jurjan al Hafid al Sahmi that Um Sufyan al Thawri said, Oh, my son, seek knowledge and I will support you through the earnings of my spin wheel. She's a single mother, she's raising, she's making money through to making whatever it's clothes, whatever she's doing. And the money she uses to support Sufyan al Thawri, the Imam al Muhaddithin. Imam al Zai and Sir al also mentioned he grew up orphan, raised by his mother. Two of the greatest ulama in the history of Islam. You know, we, we hear about Shafi'i, we're going to talk about it, but look at these. You know, sometimes today we, we, we're not telling single mothers and the mothers who are in the situation they're in, they have sons, children, the stories that they need to hear. We're telling them things that make it difficult for them. Why don't we tell them these ones? Like, you're not alone. There are great women before you who have raised great imam, imams, and you can do it too, but Allah's tawfiq. Until if you go to biography of Al-Zai, Imam Al-Zai, it's mentioned, subhanAllah, one of the imams, he was once chastising one of the children. And he told him, he told him, what's the matter with you, يعني, in terms of your behavior? One Imam Al-Zai, he grew up an orphan with his mom, right, with his mother's house, and he and he became an imam, such that it was said that uh, Imam Al-Zai raised himself when he got older, because obviously he was by himself a lot. But he was trying to chastise a child, saying that what's the matter with you? When there's an orphan boy there who grew up with your mom and his mom raised him properly and you can't be raised properly with your parents, you know. As if to say that you you should be in a situation that was easier for you. But see, the tawfiq min Allah. And this is now the best exact story. Authentic change in tradition. Kama Shafi'i is narrating his own story of his mom. It's all about his mom in the beginning. Jan bayan al fadl imam Ibn Abdul Barr, he mentioned in the issue 603, yeah, Shafi says himself, I was an orphan in my mother, mother's home, and she used to send me to the Qutab, where you learn the Quran and the writing and reading. And she didn't have any money to pay the teacher. But the teacher was pleased with me to replace him whenever he was away. How did he learn? He used to sit and listen to what the kids were saying, memorize it. When the teacher's not there, he takes his place. His hip was that good, right? So he has no, no book. Can't he learn. He's not in the, he's not in the halaqa, but he's listening. When he memorizes it, teacher's busy, he's a replacement substitute. That's how he gets the free classes. So he said, when I finished the Quran, I rented the masjid, I used to sit with the scholars, and I used to listen to the hadith or an issue of knowledge, and I would memorize them. My mother did not have any money to buy me paper. So if I would find a scorched bone on the outside, I would take it and write it, write on it. If it became full, I would throw it in the old jar of ours. Then the governor of Yemen once came, because this time he was living in Mecca. He's originally, where I'm sure he's from, uh, of Palestine. All right, so uh, he says that he came and some of the Quraysh spoke to him on my behalf saying that I am from our companions, the name of the And also they mentioned that his lineage also runs right back to Yemen. So there's, he goes to Yemen, but he's also, they say, originally born in, in, in Palestine. So it's a connection. But he says, now my mother did not have money to escape it to Yemen, so she rented her home for 16 dinars. And then she gave it to me and I went along to Yemen until the end of the story keeps going. You know, these kinds of stories are unbelievable. It's amazing. Because it shows us that when somebody's striving for Allah's path, there is no such thing as an excuse, right? Anything is possible, Allah's permission. But imagine she has no money. And her son becomes who? Yama Shafi, alhamdulillah. The greatest among right? the four imams. And today in our head, when we think about these stories, of course, some of us might have heard the story, but also just look at the mom, mom, mom. That's the impact of a good mother. And when she sacrifices, it's not just for herself, for Imam Shafi and all the dua that we make for him and all the khayr that we get from him, the knowledge and benefits we ascribe to him. And to who? By extension, his mom, right? Because we, even though we might not know her, or many of us might not have known her until today, of course, Allah, he knows her. And the last one for today, which we will conclude with, none other than Um Abdullah Asma bint Abu Bakr Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anha. An absolute amazing example of mother. Asma, we know that she gave birth to the first child in Medina, Abdullah bin Zubayr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. And we spoke about Abdullah bin Zubayr before as a great role model, as a child who was raised. But what happened to Ibn Zubayr and what about Asma's great patience? Because the end of the life is way different than the beginning. Number one, she made hijrah while pregnant with Abdullah Zubair, and that's why we know that she she had the waistband that she used to cover, I tie her around her waist. 
in order to go into to 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 help uh, carry on one she cut in two so one part she carried the food to the Prophet and her father Abu when they were in the journey to Medina right uh, the Hijrah and the other one she wears so that's the first part she's pregnant Abdul Zubair number two she gives birth to Abdul Zubair in Medina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does the tahniq right he puts a date in the mouth the uh, saliva goes in so again amazing look what she's doing for a child right and next later on in life Abdul Zubair like, has a problem with Hajjaj and Yusuf and is it Maui and others, right? They had the problems of governance because he was the governor of Mecca and a lot of dispute happened. Look what the hadith says. The people of Sham were taunting Abdullah ibn Zubair. And they're calling him that in right? You're the woman, you're the son of the Ibn. You're the son of the woman who had two belts. As if it's something bad, right? So he went to his mom and said, Mom, they're saying this about me. And then she explained to him that the virtue of that. Imagine how could someone criticize them for something which is virtuous? Allah Akbar. In any case, the end of the story, and this is what I want to finish with, the sabr she has for the murder of her son, the long hadith, Yisayih Muslim, what happened to Abu Zubair, he was killed, he was killed by Hajjaj. And how she was able to overcome that with, with absolute honor. So eventually the story continues in tariq that he got killed by Hajjaj Yusuf. Sayyidina so Umar uh, Abu Nufal says, I saw the body of Abdul Zubair hanging on the road of Medina, and the Quraysh used to pass by and other people because he left him hanging there. Imagine, Hajjaj Musa, what he did. So Abdul Abu Umar one day, Rabbi Abdul Talmud saw it, and he stood up there and he and made, right, he made another peace upon you, Abu Khubayb, Abu Khubayb, which is his nickname, and he made dua for him. Then he went and spoke to Hajjaj about him to take his body down, have respect for them as a Sahabi. The story continues. And when he got the body down, what happens now? Hajjaj and Yusuf. He wants a smell to come and to pick up the body because he threw it where? Into the graves of the Jews. Can you imagine? The first man, boy, son born in town of Rasulullah in Medina. The Sahabi who was a scholar of Islam, who was a Khalifa at one point of that region. So what happens? Hajjaj says, that tells a smell to come pick him up. She said, no, I refuse to. So he sent the messenger telling her she must come or otherwise he will bring her forcefully, catching her behold of the hair by her head. And he pulling her by the hair. So she refused again and said, By Allah, I will not come to you until you send one to me who will drag me by pulling my hair. So out of anger, then bringing Hajjaj took his shoes, he said, Bring my shoes. And he went and he walked all the way to her out of anger. And he told her, How do you find what I've done with the enemy of Allah? So she said, I find that you wronged him in this world, whereas he has spoiled your next life. You know, the words she said there, Allah Akbar, right? You ruined his you, you ruined his uh, dunya, he ruined your akhirah. Again, she's talking to Hajjaj like this. Again, who's Hajjaj? We said 120,000 Sahabi and Salafi killed at Tirmidhi Mitchell, authentically, one on one. That's this is Hajjaj. This is when he comes to Hadith. He's the Mudbiran, he's the Punisher. And then he says, If you convince me that you used to call him by the son and two belts, etc., so she's so she's responding to what the criticism being made by him. And it's about alive indeed. I mean, did a woman with two belts, one which is the help which I used to suspend the high, the food of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Bakr, they can reach the animals. So far as the second one, I'm concerned that that belt which no woman can dispense with. And when a woman wears it at home when she's doing her duties and like her chores and stuff. Then he says, she says, Barely Allah's Messenger told us that in Thaqif there will be born a great liar and a great murderer, the liar we have seen, which is Mukhtar al Thaqafi. Right, that's who he is, the liar. As for the murderer, he's concerned, I do not find anyone else besides you. There, Bahajaz stood up and he didn't apply to her, he left. You know, Asma's story, what's most interesting about these beautiful words is the courage and strength and patience. You know, all that she left for Abdullah Zubair in his life, and he's died like this, and she she didn't wave. Even in the narration, when he came to seek advice, what should I do about what's happening? He told her to, she told him to fear Allah and to do the right thing. I and mean, don't give up, don't turn back. And again, these stories give us encouragement to see that women behind the scenes. Mothers who are behind great men, they can do so many things without being seen, without being, you know, in our side today, right, on the spotlight. And that shows it again, motherhood is, again is for women, nothing less than on the status, as you mentioned and explained in today's lesson, but also the problem we may find today where our society, Allah uh, Musta'an, needs to be reminded of it. Right? May Allah subhanahu wa accept not that which we mentioned. And we hope, inshallah ta'ala, in the future, we can pick up on these topics in greater detail. Uh, inshallah, I'm going to stop the recording. Any questions, we'll take it, inshallah ta'ala.